No, no, you can go ahead. And good day, everyone. Good day. Uh, hope that everyone is having a good day so far and all is well. All right, before I start, I'm wishing to the farmers, happy farmers month. Still have about three to four days to go in the month. So I'm wishing you a happy farmers month from the AGCHEM team. All right. All right. I'm John I. Johnson. I'll be a presenter for the day and I'll want to welcome you to another Zoom training where we try to focus on interesting topics uh, shared either by the farmers or topics that we feel is crucial to the farmer, right? Or any growth. And I'm a product development agronomist for the Southeast region. So we're covering St. Catherine, St. Andrew, St. Thomas, and Kingston. All right. So the focus of today is strengthening plants against viral attacks. And with summer around the corner, we have to focus on viral control, right? So persons who are familiar with your tomato, your sweet pepper, papaya, et cetera, know that the crops are very susceptible, especially the variety is not resistant or tolerant, right? So understanding what to do and what you're looking for is very key in preventing or controlling any such viral attacks. That's it. And there you have it. Want to knock the virus out of the ballpark, right? So we want to get a healthy crop. So we're knocking them out of the ballpark. All right. All right. And the focus of today is what is a virus? How are viruses transmitted? Common plant viruses common vectors, also other vectors, solutions that we carry, uh, foliar nutrients, and viral control strategies that you can implement going further forward. All right, so let's begin. Let, let me give you a little history about the virus, right? Or viruses. Uh, so in the 19th century, two scientists basically realized that the tobacco industry was being affected by something they could not describe, could not describe mainly because it was so it was very small so they were unable to fully identify it so they came up with a concept that there was something affecting the plants that was very small had some form of life not fully living but was basically causing serious affect Havoc on the plant health. So the first known virus to be this identified was a tobacco mosaic virus. Yeah, so back then the tobacco industry, well, still big in certain areas, was going through the issue of the mosaic virus, right? So they so the tobacco mosaic virus was the first to be identified. And currently, there are basically over 4,000 viruses identified, and that's between plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, etc. right? But of knowing there is about approximately a thousand plant-related viruses, so we have a lot to deal with. Locally, we may not encounter as much, but there is a, there is a, a good percentage of plant viruses that affect the industry, right? And to give to give an understanding, what's a virus? All right. Basically, the general structure of a virus is that it has nucleic acid, right? Being DNA or RNA, but generally is RNA surrounded by a protein sheet. Right. So that's the general structure of a virus. And this is different, and this may vary depending on if it's a bacteria, if it's plant or animal. So the structure may vary, but generally you have a nucleic acid center surrounded by a protein sheet. All right. And I said before, these are very small. So we're talking about uh, about 30 minus 30 nanometers. So these are very small, even difficult to see with a, a normal light microscope. So we're talking very small organisms. All right. And what you have to understand is that, you know, 
the virus doesn't a virus does not function like a normal cell right does not function like a normal cell. and what do i mean is that it does not reproduce and divide into daughter cells like your, your average cells would do so these they basically depend on a living organism or a host to carry out their function right so instead of dividing and creating daughter cells they have to depend on the different materials that make them up to create their or continue their division we're talking about so you'd have to have a pool of uh, nucleic acid a pool of proteins and some other uh key elements to create your, back, your virus all right and because they're not similar to your normal cell as i said before they don't divide as your normal cell would do and what the key term that they usually use is that they're obligate parasites and said before they depend on a host to survive but if they're outside of a host they won't be able to multiply or basically move right they essentially depend on a host to operate they have to understand that other cells don't depend on a host i mean i depend on a host but for viruses they do depend on a host and that is why many persons even today there's discussions whether they are actually true living things right yeah all right and and an next point is that you know because they they don't depend because they depend on a host they need different factors or different elements to uh, carry them around so we're talking about you need either vectors or environment or basically any 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 aid that will get them to a host that's how they basically operate right and gen and an next general term is that there are no known cause for the uh our solution our curative action for them right so that's why what we try to do is either eliminate them by and what i mean by eliminate is try to not have your crops being affected by them right follow the main group please all right i touch a little bit on this well how they are really transmitted all right basically uh because the cuticle and the cell wall of plant cells are generally rigid and firm a virus can just easily enter the cell so usually you have to have some form of mechanical damage or in the case where you have vectors for example a white fly that pierce into the tissue or the cell of the plant that's how you have virus entering your cell tissue and what happens after they enter or what they call a variant what happens after it enter and variant i should i uh, should highlight is basically viral particles right particles of the virus so what happens after the the variant enters is that the protein protein sheet breaks down right and that releases that nucleic acid the nucleic acid has to then enter the nucleus of the cell and that's it because they depend on on a host they have to basically infiltrate the brain of the cell so see it as a see it as a takeover they have to infiltrate the main system of the cell to carry out their function so when they infiltrate that main system they can trigger now the cell to produce proteins that will help them one multiply so they can create more nucleic acid also create more proteins and even add to other structural components and the next thing what they uh the next factor is that they can use these the nucleus of the cell to even create proteins that help them to move other areas or facilitate them to move to other cells right so basically a simple breakdown is that thinking about an enemy infiltrating the camp taking over the main control and allowing that control to guide their multiplying effect right so put that in the thought and before i go on there are several ways viruses can travel 
through your plan system. As I mentioned before, either through the mechanical damage, but when they're in the multiplying stage, they, they depend on what you call the plasma desmata, right? These are basically tiny passages that links one cell to another. Understand? They links one cell to another. Or you can picture it as doors entering from one room to the next. The tiny passage that will allow their movement to another cell. But however, because the process is, is sometimes time consuming or, or very slow, it's not an efficient way for the virus to take over the plant. So what you have happening is that the virus has to basically enter what you want in the flowing system. Basically, the trans, one of the transport systems of the plant, that is a better way to get the, the multiplied virus uh, around the system. So let us imagine you know, if you want to get to Kingston, but one of the option is basically walking. You have several rooms attached together and you walk and you're pulling doors to get all the way to Kingston. You can picture how long that would take, right? What the other option will, is to travel through the flowing system and we picture the flowing system as your, your highway. That would be an easier system. You get on the highway, bam, you're into Kingston. So that's what the, vir the virus try to target, creating proteins that will help them to facilitate the quick movement along that highway. So when they get to Queenstown now, they can then now enter different, enter different buildings, which is different cells through the plasma this matter, right? And then you have your transmission. And uh, the process of in the time of infection usually takes from, from initial infection so uh, complete spread can take uh, from several hours to weeks. So it depends on the environmental condition, uh, how fast the plant is basically trying to process, how quick the multi how quick the virus is multiplying, and which and this generally depends on how fast that particular plant produces that amount of protein, right? So environmental factors can affect it and the uh, multiplying effect of the virus can affect how quick the virus take over plant. But generally, they can take within two weeks, the virus can completely uh, take over a plant. All right. All right. So before we go on, we're gonna before we go on, uh quick recap. Understanding the virus, as I said, the center has a nucleic acid interior, and then you know, that is surrounded by your protein sheet, right? But when we're dealing with the viruses, one of the key things to note is what do they look like? Or what are the symptoms? Sorry, what are the symptoms we will see when we're dealing with viruses? And as I said, the first one, first virus to be described was the tobacco mosaic virus, right? And this is one of the most important one in the industry, even locally, right? Because uh, what you have happening is that, you know, you have infection in tobacco, as the name suggests, sweet pepper, tomato, and other salinaceous species. But do not limit the infection to only uh, important crops. They can have weed species that fall prey to this virus as well. All right, so let us go through it now. General symptoms, you'll see mottling, where you have uh, patterns of dark green, dark green coloration to light green. So based on the pictures, you're seeing those patterns, those mosaic patterns. Yes, that is one of, one of the key symptoms of the tobacco mosaic virus. And when the infection gets uh, to a high level, you're going to see necrosis. And in picture B, you're seeing those brown lesions. Uh, those are sites where the virus is. The virus is right? So those, that causes necrosis of the plant leaf. And I said generally, you will see similar, similar symptoms in different crops. So below, you're seeing the 
tomato, you see that mosaic pattern, that light and light green and dark green pattern, and to the right in sweet pepper, light and dark green. A key thing is to know, this is a virus that can survive in the soil for about two years, especially when the, uh, the soil is dry. You can have the virus surviving for two years. And the virus can affect your planting, your seed material, your seedlings, and your adult plants, and even can spread from the fruit or by the fruit, right? And I think to note, especially for persons who are avid smokers, the curing process of the tobacco does not control the, to the tobacco mosaic virus. It does not stop it or kill it. So you can have a case where you, you are smoking a cigarette and the virus is present in that, that tobacco material. And, that, and by just smoking that, that can be passed on to your crops, right? So once your crop is susceptible, that can be passed on. Other means of, of basically transmission, by touching. So if a worker touches an infected plant material or touches a cigarette, you can pass it on by a clothing and brush on it uh, by basically what else? Any form, of in, any form of interaction. So, or either you're sucking insects, they can transmit the tobacco mosaic virus, right? So this is one of the most important one in the industry. And remember, it can stay active in the soil for up to two years, right? Moving on. All right, another popular one, is a tomato yellow leaf curl virus. And as the name suggests, what you have is that the leaf basically starts to curl, usually upwards, and you get a rigid structure. So if this, if this tends to affect a plant in the younger stage, what will have happen is that the plant starts to show stunted growth, a severe curling of the leaf, Necrosis, necrosis basically dying of the cells. So you have brown areas, brown lesions on the plant. And what happens is that uh, basically because the, the virus is interrupting the natural transport system or the production system of the plant, you have the plant showing a deformed leaf, yellowing another leaf. You're going to, if the plant is flowering, you're, you're going to see flower drop, right? And <clears throat> Do not limit this virus to only two meter because it can affect most of your salinaceous and other weeds, right? And this, uh, locally you may hear it by the name of Gemini virus, two meter Gemini virus, right? Or the Gemini virus, yeah. So this is one of the most popular one. And especially when the time is hotter, when the water demand by the plant is greater, you have the virus being expressed. All right. So generally, a, a farmer would say that uh, when it comes to the summer, I'm seeing a lot of my plants in Jerry, which is a common, which is a popular term we use locally. We're talking about that excessive curl, so we link it to Jerry curl. All right. The same thing right here. So in that summer period, you have the virus being expressed even greater because of the demand on the plant, and and even even when the plant enters the fruiting stage, which requires a lot of nutrients to be moved to the fruit, you will see the virus start to be expressed. And to note that this virus is passed by white fly, a species of white fly. So uh, your insecticide control is very crucial here. We're talking about from your nurse's stage, from all the way up. Try to basically minimize or control the white fly population. So generally, uh, farmers tend to basically avoid our insecticide control even in the nursery stage. But at this stage, you can have intrusion on a white fly, which can pass on the tomato yellow leaf curl virus. All right. An important one, not popular, but a lot of the Greenhouse growers are aware of the tomato spotted with virus. Yes. And for, for persons who have done onion 
and by chance have planted a crop of tomato near the onion field, they would have seen the tomato spotted with virus. And as I said before, not don't go by the name to limit the virus to only tomato. You can have infection in most of your salinaceous crops and also your weed species you can display the virus, right? So generally what you have, what you see basically necrosis of the leaf, great deformation. I know it looks similar to your yellow leaf curl or your mosaic virus. However, the distinct feature is that basically bubble, bubbled kind of look or, or viral, if I may say a viral look of the leaves. So your deformed edges basically uh, not uniformed in terms of your coloration. You're getting, you're not getting exactly a mosaic pattern, but you're seeing blotches of green, areas of yellow on your foliage. And especially when the crop is fruiting, then you can easily tell that it's spotted with virus. Because for example, with the tomatoes and sweet peppers, you're seeing some ring formation, which usually follows some slight but distinct sink in the plant. So the surface of the plant is not uniform. You're getting all of those uniform, those rings around the plant. You see those circular rings? Yeah, those are very distinct on the plant. For sweet pepper, similar thing. So uneven ripening, the distinct rings there, deformity in the leaf, severe, severe yellowing, or I mean severe deformation of the leaf. It was light green to dark green blotches. And this virus now is spread by your trips, right? It could be your Western flower trip or your onion trips or your melon trips, right? And in the later, later slides, you will basically go through the different vectors or some of the vectors that can uh, spread the different viruses. But for this one, it's spread by trips and trips are basically very minute pests. So if you are growing a field of onion, and you don't have the trips population under control, and then you have a, a feel of sweep up near it, there's a high possibility that the virus can be passed on to your, your sweep up or your tomato field. All right. I wanted to make I want, and why this virus is so devastating is that uh, the, the virus basically lingers within, within the, the stomach of the trips. Generally, some virus will stay on the outer parts of the vector or the insect. With this virus, I think it multiplies within the stomach. So you can have this virus, you can have easy transmission of this virus, even within a two week period. All right, let's move on. Our next common one, the Strustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustrustr
uh, after about 30 to 60 minutes of sucking, uh, the aphids can easily transmit the virus. And if that aphid, if, if for example, aphid that suck the suck an infected plant, the virus can stay within the system of the aphid for about 24 to 48 hours. All right, so if you get feeding within a time, you can have easy transmission of the virus. And because uh, the orange plant is so large, you have to basically do proper, proper spray control, or you can do non-chemical control to minimize the aphid population. And we can talk about that later. All right. All right. And some other, some other common viruses that we see locally. So you have your bunch it up virus, which pass on transmitted by a species of aphids, uh, similar to your ring spot. Right. Uh, and your cucumber mosey virus. And these are aphid transmitted viruses. You have other others out there, which uh, for other viruses that we can mention, but to give you a general idea of what's going on. So, so far you hear some of the main vectors that aphids, white flies, the trips, right? Those are some of the crew are the more important Fucking insects we have to watch out when we're doing our cultivation. So, like all the time, it's getting hotter for who doing the tomato, your sweet pepper, your cucumber, your papaya. Basically, be on the watch out for these pests. All right. All right. So let's go into some of the common vectors. One of the popular ones, as most person know, is the white fly. And these are generally small white insects, about 1.5 millimeters, right? It's, and we're talking about the adult stage. And generally, you see two black spots on the on the forewing for the white other on the adult. Right? Eggs generally pale, elongated, about 0.1 millimeters. And for the larvae, they are flat or oval or semi and semi-transparent, ranging from a 0.3 to one millimeters. Okay? And these pests basically thrive when the conditions are hot. So what they have happening is that, you know, when the temperatures have increased, the adults or the females basically lay their eggs on, on the foliage of the plant. And those eggs develop and you turn to the larva that stays mobile for a time and in that stage what it tends to do is to feed vigorously on the plant so because the numbers are high you generally have what we call honeydew being farmed and that's the byproduct byproduct of them feeding on the plants so and the honeydew is a sugar substance that you see being emitted on the foliage of the plant just because of the feeding from the white fly and that gen and that is generally followed by your your mole being formed usually your gray mole being formed based on based on the mole driving off the honeydew all right but the most impo the important factor about white fly is that you know transmission of viruses right? because they are sucking insects what usually happens is that you know, the virus may linger on the external portion of the white fly, but when they pierce the foliage of the plants, you can have easy transmission of the virus. And as I said before, because they thrive in hot conditions, and that's 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 a time when a lot of when you easily see the stress on the plant, the effect is the effect is even greater. Right? So because the plant comes under additional water demand in the hotter time, and the white fly population increases greatly, they have a compound effect. And that's why crops like, for example, tomato, go severe stunting and curling when a viral transmission has occurred. Right? So this is one of the pests you have to watch out for, the white flies. And we have solutions for that, which I'm going to talk about. All right, next one. It should be common to, uh, to farmers out there, because right now, with the recent rain, 
and the increase in weed growth, you see a lot of aphid popping up. Right? And for aphids, you have different colors. So uh, well, you have different species. So you have dark green aphids, brown aphids, and uh, even pink aphids. So the colors based on the species. The adults, for the potato aphid, the adults are generally large with a pear shape, right? So they can easily in by the naked eye. So once you turn over that foliage of the plant, you can easily distinguish an aphid uh, from your trips, from your white and from your white fly, right? You're having that nice pear shape formation. And then up to the back, you have the quarter, which is basically like finger-like projections at the rear. So that's, a, that's another distinguish from them. So your pear shape, and then that finger-like projection at the back. And as I said, they are larger than your trips, so you can easily identify them. And you see them in different colors. So for who have cucumber crops out there, your melon crops, you're not controlling them, you'll see plant being severely curled. And if you if you look on the other side of that on the foliage, observe, you can see the aphid adults, right? And generally, even before looking on the other side, you will see the honeydew formation and it will appear shiny, but if the mole has started to grow, you'll see uh, a dark, a black appearance on the foliage that the honeydew has still on. And the aphids is one of the most important ones because the different species spread virus across the plant kingdom. So talking about, as I heard, saw before, your potato, your, your cucurbits, papaya, your citrus. So this is a very important piece to agriculture as it regards the spread of viruses. So controlling them is very key and they are sucking pests. So uh, use of systemic control is very crucial in your control mechanism. Let me continue to the other one. And trips. Trips are many persons, many persons know, especially with the increase in pepper production, are focusing on trips as a major pest. It has been around for several uh, for ages. But no, it is being a, a major factor. A persons may not have realized it early in their onset of, or in the early stages of their agricultural uh, growth, but no persons are, are able to identify. And this is mainly because of the small nature of the trips. And there you have it, 0.5 to one millimeter long. And for persons who are familiar with trips, know that, uh, to identify them, you have to either, for onions, you have to open the inner leaf and you see, see them in either brown, black, or close to a pinkish coloration, right? Very minute insects. So I'm talking about you have to zoom in. If you have to use the aid of a magnifying glass, you can. For crops like sweet pepper, no, what you want to do, turn over that leaf and look within the intervenal spaces. So the space is near to the vein. You look there and you'll see some tiny brown, brown insect walking, walking around, right? And when the population is very great, what you have is a transmission of viruses and even symptoms being displayed, right? So you're seeing that curling, severe curling of the leaf, uh, deformation, you're getting flower drop, you're getting for, for even for the wilted uh, tomato spotted with virus, you're getting discarded foods that you can't use in your, uh, in your display, and overall severe damage of the plant foliage, right? So this is a piece that we need to focus on going forward. Control has, has been difficult, I mean, because there are predominantly contact herbs insecticides on the market, right? But for to properly control the trips, there has to be proper rotation of your pesticides and even cultural control, which I'm gonna go into shortly. All right, other vectors, you have nematodes, yes, and nematodes can pass on virus. You have mites, right? So either your broad mites, spider mites, 
they can also pass on virus as well. Leaf hoppers and your beetle, right? And there are other pests or fungi out there that can transmit plant-related viruses. But I say for based on the duration of time, we're just focusing on these. All right. So before I basically go into the range of insecticides that we have at ICAM, the first concept is to try to do cultural control, right? And what that means, what that means is that where you consider using your insecticide, you have to take precaution or follow the right measures to minimize any viral attack, right? So what we're talking about, you can select uh, you can select varieties that are either tolerant, right? So what I mean by tolerant, the virus may affect them in terms of infiltrate the system, but you have that variety still producing close to the threshold level, right? So despite being affected, variety will still perform. And a variety of note is your deli tomato. Even if it has the tomato yellow leaf virus, it will still give you a decent production, right? Uh, secondly, you can, you can choose varieties that are resistant. So varieties that naturally produce proteins or basically have system in place to, to eradicate any infected cell. So once a cell is infected, that variety has an internal system that would get rid of that cell to, to minimize the virus multiplying within the plant. The next thing is to, that I love to focus on, weed control. So minimize any, minimize the weeds within your field. So once, once you're not using it as any source of income, get it out of the field. Because as stated before, many of, the, many of these weeds are host to the viruses. So you have to look out for that. And, and if you go to your field later on, you'd basically walk and realize that some of the symptoms I've identified can be seen in a lot of your weed species. And, and that means you're a host of weeds and you want to get them out to your field. All right, other ways. You have natural enemies that can control a lot of these vectors, right? So you have parasitic wasps that would control your white fly or something if it's so that's a good thing. So what that means is that you have to be aware of your beneficial insects. Try to minimize the control of them. Right? So because those would be crucial in your production system. All right. Other ways to other other non non-chemical ways is that you can basically create borders around your crop. So generally, if you're doing, if you're doing about an acre cultivation, a half acre to an acre, you can do establish borders, for example, like corn, where if aphids are being in our, aphids are basically entering the field, they would have to pass that border before they enter the crop. And generally, if it's not a systemic, the virus is not internally, and what I mean is within the aphid mode part, it will be uh, the virus will be able to wash off it's if it's on the mode part of the virus, right? So if it's on the mode part, just by sucking on the corn, the virus can be washed off on the corn material. But if it's internally, depending on the type of aphid, it can or depending on the type of virus, it can spread. But establishing borders is good. Yeah, so those are some of the, the control mechanisms you can use. Oh, and in addition, proper crop rotation. So you would want to follow a tomato crop with a sweet pepper, right? Because for the mosaic virus, as I said, it can linger within the soil or linger within the plant material. And this can be up to two years. They do want to use do back-to-back -back cultivation, the same crop in the same year. The crop rotation is very ideal, right? So after doing those, or carrying out those practices, what you can then to move on to 
Atkins insecticide solution. So in the lineup, what we have, what we try to do at Atkins is to carry a range of insecticides and range, as I mean, not in terms of the name only, but in terms of active ingredients. So we recommend rotation in active. All right, and one of the first one is your caprid. And that's the acetamiprid, right? And it's a contact and a systemic solution. So we'll call it a double systemic insecticide. What that does is to basically, if you have a case where you're spraying and the residue of the, of the chemical link is present on the foliage and the aphid or white fly interacts with that, you'll get control. Or if the aphid or the white fly decide to suck on the foliage, you'll still get control as well. And this product, you can use it at 5 ml per gallon. You can use that one teaspoon per gallon uh, to basically get control of your white fly, your aphids, your stink bug, uh, your leaf uppers, the so, uh, most hardback insects will be controlled by a cap rate, right? The next solution is your definite, which is a contact insecticide and actually delta metrin, right? This can be used in rotation with your cap rate, and this will control your aphids, your white fly as well, the stink bugs, your leaf hoppers, right? And this is an EC product, right? So when the formulation touches water, you'll see it turn white. And you must have a concentrate. All right, another product in the lineup is a Conta, is a diazinon, very effective. So you can do your drenching, your drench application with this, and your foliar application. Right? And that diazinon control a range of pests. So hardback and soft, soft bodied insects can be controlled. So we're talking about the trips to white fly, aphids, leaf miner, etc. All right, and next. Form of control is our botanic guard. It's a softer chemistry and which is organically certified. And this is the formulation of this is Bovira bassiani, which is a soil fungus. So this will give excellent control of your trips, your aphids. So for the growers who are in the greenhouses or screenhouses, it's a nice solution, right? or for persons who are doing backyard gardening, this is a good option for them. Or if you're close to harvesting and you're, and you're, you're doing a crop that is sensitive to the pre, sensitive in terms of the pre-harvest, botany guard is a good option. All right, another option is the REFAS, which has the name reverse safer, right? This is a safer option. And generally, I use this or recommend this product uh, close to when you're about to harvest, right? So it's a softer formulation. It has a short pre-harvest of three, three days, right? And active is potassium oleate. So it's like a soap ingredient. And what this will do, this will control your aphids, your white fly, your stink bug, and other pests. And in, the, and in addition to your insecticide control, you're getting also fungicide control. So control in your powdery, powdery milieu and also your mites, generally the spider mites, right? So that's a good option. The application rate is a bit higher than the rest of them. So we're talking about 75 ml or five tablespoons per gallon. But based on the cost of this product, work out as if you're using a normal insecticide. So those are some of the options you can work with in terms of controlling your vectors. All right, let's continue. You have your coveril, right? And as the name suggests, the active is coveril. And this is an effective product. You can basically use it as, as a drench foliar or based on the application, some person use it in the farm, the powdered farm, right? And this is very effective. The broad spectrum says so it's very effective in controlling aphids, white fly, trips, leaf miners, worms, uh, and the list goes on. So a very effective product that you can include in your control mechanism. And generally, if you're having a high infestation, sometimes what I recommend, if you can combine your contact solution with your systemic as regarding insecticide, 
right? So because they have they're they're of different mode of action, you won't have the chemicals interfering each other. All right. Next solution is your caratrox contact contact uh, insecticide, which will control some of the aphids, white fly, and it's a archaeocide, so controlling your adult mites. So this is an excellent con uh, solution, especially when you have a short pre harvest window. So the pre harvest for this, for most vegetable crops, is two days, while for corn, it's 20 days. So for corn, it's a bit longer. You have to consider that. But this would be a good control solution. And we have, finally, we have the uh, cure. Cure is a con contact insecticide with the active abomectin. And this product has a low application rate of about half to one teaspoon per gallon, so 2.5 to 5 ml per gallon. And this is both insecticide and a mighty side. So we're talking about control of your white fly aphids, especially when the population is a bit lower, because the biological you want to uh, come in when the population is a bit lower, right? And also it will give control to adult mites. And generally what we recommend you combine it for your first application, you combine it with your Nizaran, right? Nizaran is a mighty side that will control the eggs, the larvae, and the nymphs. So those are some of your solutions that we have. And for, for, for more solutions, you can check our calendar that will have a list of insecticide uh, that you can use to control. So the whole point of this is basically what I'm trying to get to you is after using your cultural control, what you have to do is maintain rotation with your insecticide. Understand? Because once you have infection, especially in the early stage, because a lot of times I see where persons basically get seedlings. However, they are not vigilant that their uh, white fly may have been sucking on the seedlings or it has aphids because of the, the plant is not showing any symptoms at the time persons are not are not keen to apply the insecticide as early as the sealing stage and if those varieties are susceptible any other virus what you have is that when the plant approaches a production phase the flowering and fruiting you'll have display of the virus right and this will severely impact your production that you're looking for so early scouting and early application is very crucial that would cover the vector aspect of it. Moving in into your to look to look for that optimal performance for your plant. So remember, with the virus it generally affects the flowing flowing system of the plant. It generally affects or diverts the main processes of your cells. So you have cells that focus on growth, development, uh, pushing cytokine, auxin, etc. Right. Because the virus is interfering with that system or piggybacking on that system, what you have to do is boost your plant with foliar complements. As most persons are aware to apply their base fertilizers, right? And we have base fertilizers from the Abodam and Elixir line. But what is also crucial is your foliar application. The reason being, a lot of these foliar solutions that I can carry has a lot of micronutrients and biostimulants. Micronutrients we're talking about the molybdenum, the copper, the zinc, etc. Right? Anything to boost it, the manganese, anything to boost the plant's immunity. All right? So foliar options we're talking about, omics bio 20, essential from the seedling stage straight up to your productive stage. So for for in the early stage of your production, you can use this in the ceiling. So using that about two teaspoons per gallon, you do a drench that will encourage quick root development, quick foliage growth, and also with the with the biostimulant factor, it's basically building the immunity of the plant or the structure of the plant, right? So a healthy plant means a plant that is able to easily fight off any viral infection. So there might be a case where you have seedlings, white fly comes in, may infect L with a virus, but with the with the 
boosted immunity, the plant can easily, easily eradicate that cell and continue with fresh living, right? So bio twins is one of the crucial products to have in your position. All right, our next product, Omics Fortify, uh, phosphate, phosphate, where we have a phosphate, phosphate and phosphate, right? And phosphate will help with quick movements and nutrients. So for plants that have their full flowing system being affected, this is very crucial to allow for even, even greater movements of your nutrients in the plant. And the phosphate aspect, what it, what it does is that this, this component can bind to your fungicide or your insecticide or any other nutrients like calcium and carry, carry them quickly through the plant. So you have the process of move, nutrient movement being quicker, right? Than waiting on the system of the plant to carry those nutrients. And because they're foliar also, you're, tar you're targeting more sites. They have more foliage sites that you can target based on the application. So you don't have to wait until the roots and the nutrients to the plants or the, or the leaf sending the nutrients towards the roots. You can have that, that quick uh, supply of nutrients to the plant just because of the foliar component. An next crucial one is the solid growth kickstart, right? The name suggests you're getting that quick boost of phosphorus and micronutrients to the plant. This product from Miller is very key in terms of the biostimulant component of this. Uh, when you're doing your transplant, a quick drench with this product, we're talking about, you can use it from about two to three teaspoons per gallon. Do it as a drench, you combine it with your cytokine green skin and getting that quick bolster for your ceiling. So boosting your boost, boosting the immunity of your plant or your root development very quickly, right? So greater root mass, you're getting that greater movements and nutrients, healthier plants. Quick start for the crop. And we're transitioning to our the remaining products from our Miller line. So you have the Nutrient Express, a very popular option, a very popular option for farmers, where high in phosphorus, a good amount of potassium. So this product allows for quick foliage development, uh, quick root development, and basically a continue uh, increase in production, production straight through. So you can use it from the early stage. So we're talking about you can use it two weeks after your transplant straight up into your productive phase. So you're getting your micronutrients, you're getting your biostimulant effect, and you're getting some amount of micronutrients. And remember, farmers, the express technology, what we're talking about, 15 minutes after applied, the product is working within the plant, right? 15 minutes after applied, you're getting that product moving through the plant. And if your tomato plant is being affected by a virus, this is a, an easy way to get the nutrients moving throughout the plant and getting basically trying to trying to trying to recover some of the last the last income or, or some of the last production right next one sugar express essential product with high potassium very effective and with the same express technology you get the potassium being supplied to the roots very effectively and with boron and other elements within the formulation, you're getting that quick increase in fruit size, sweetness of your fruit, and the color, right? And, as, and I mentioned before that some of the viruses even affect your ripening of your fruit. So with this Sugar Express, that will help to even out the tone of your fruit and leading to a better product on the shelf. And one of the popular ones which farmers, you need to get this one before the summer season. Right, the ZMC Express, very effective product. And the name suggests your, your zinc, your magnesium, your calcium, very effective micronutrient product is even crucial in our viral control program, right? They need to acquire this. And this similar, similar Express technology, within 15 minutes of spraying on, those micronutrients are moving to the key sites of the plants. And when plants are under stress, the micronutrients become very important in carrying out a lot of your 
protein building processes, structural processes, and the list goes on. So this is a very effective product you need to have. All right, other products? As Calmax B, essential. So we're talking about most of the cells need, need proper, our proper supply of the calcium. And because virus tend to affect the, or tend to attack the cells, creating rigid cells is very crucial. I remember I said mechanical damage is one of the, the most common way the virus will enter the cell, right? If it's not, if it's not produced by a vector. So calcium within your cell wall is needed. So, and with the Calmax B formulation, it applying it foliarly. So within a short time, you're having all your, your cells supplied with calcium. Right, and the good thing about the Calmax B is that even though the foliage is, is taking most of those calcium, when you spray on the Calmax B to the fruit, you're supplying that calcium directly to that fruit source. And with, and with the boron component, that is helping with your flow of formation and also your transfer of sugar. So this is why this product can basically increase your fruit size, your color, and even your texture, right? So with that boron component, we're having sugars assimilated very quickly, right? And uh, this product has one of the, one of the highest uh, components of calcium on the market, right? So Calmax B is very crucial. Whatever, whatever crop you're doing, you need to have your Calmax B. Complete line, we have our Miller Green Stim, ideal stress reliever, and a viral, it, viral attack is considered as the plant going under stress. So the Miller Green Stim is an ideal biostimulant. And one of the key components of the Green Stim is called betaine, right? So that ingredient basically allows the plant to basically mobilize activities uh, carry out its function very quicker and also work optimum. So the green stem is essential. So heat stress, as we're going to input in some water stress in the uh, expected meridians, uh, nutrient stress when they're coming on the bearing, the green stem is a solution. And the cousin to the green stem is a cytokine with cytokinin that stimulates uh, root development, shoot development, or overall component of the plant. So in combination with your other Miller solutions like a nutrient express or a sugar express, this product can help to bolster your development of your plant, right? So even though you're going on a stress, plant can get additional cytokine in to increase the foliage despite the stress conditions, right? All right, so to recap, basically, what you want to have is that, you know, if there's a case that you have, you, you have noticed any of these symptoms affecting your plant, what you can do going forward, you can come with your chemical control. So what we're talking about, minimizing your weed bank, uh, creating barriers, also proper scouting, right? And after doing that, you're coming in with your chemical controls. So you have the options, Caprid, Cabaril, uh, Nizeron, Cure, and the, range, and the list goes on, right? So you're coming with those control strategies to also prevent any further spread of the virus. And to back up that, you're coming in with your nutrient solutions, right? And these and this, this, this aspect of the, of the program is very, is, essential. So what we're doing, we're boosting the health of the plant. So despite some of the functions that have been disabled, we are sub trying to supply the crop with additional nutrients to bolster the growth. Right? So, all time saying prevention better than cure. That is still crucial here. And, and why that is, is that if you prevent or avoid an infection in your plant with the virus, you're basically saving in costs. And what I mean is that, you know, like for example, if I, if I am basically delinquent in, in properly managing my crop and there's an infection or any other viruses, I will have to come in with a strategy. So first, stop 
any further spread. So the same amount of same amount of 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 energy that it takes for the virus to create the damage, I'd have to come with an equal amount to stop that spread, right? And then I'd have to basically put in additional energy now to basically in, in, improve potential yield. And what I mean by energy, we, we can talking about costs, the time it's gonna take, all of those factors that will drive up my overall production costs, right? So it's easier to prevent the spread of the virus, right? I remember I said, you can select but uh, varieties that are tolerant or resistant to proper weed management, uh, do, do, do scouting even for your early stage or chemical control from the early stage to prevent any spread of virus, establish borders, etc. cetera, all right? All right, so all of that said, uh, let me go into the question. And this, this um, make it a little bit easy on a Tuesday. The one stress the brain. So, huh? I have a question. Okay. Um, just a minute, just a minute. You'll get a chance. Just a minute. So there are several questions in the chat. Uh, some of them were answered, but I'll just read them and then you can take them. And then I noticed Chantal Price and is up. All right. Okay. So how can I prevent my plant from virus? Jermaine is asking, which fungicide can get rid of tomato mosaic virus? Mm -hmm. Which recommended fungicide is a cure for tomato yellow leaf curl virus? And his fourth question was, can citrus tristase virus affect other plants in the field? All right. So let, let me try to remember them. All right. So with a virus, a virus is different from a fungal problem, right? So we're talking about a different, a different form of disease. So a fungicide won't give you that control. Right? That's the person. And to note, you can you you are not able to cure the virus. What you can do is to try to keep up the health of the plant, continue to fight the virus. So there is no cure. What you do, keep up the health of the plant and minimize or control the vectors that spread the virus. So for example, you mentioned the, I think it was a yellow, 20 yellow leaf curl virus. What you want to do is to control your white fly population, right? If it's a spotted wilt, you want to control your true population. And for the tristesia, citrus tristesia virus, all right, you, you may know the virus won't affect any other crop is the, the vector that you have to worry about. So if that species of aphids can trans or can transmit another virus, then you'll have an issue. But generally, uh, virus are vector specific. So what I mean is that for the tristidia virus, it generally spread by aphids. There is a good possibility that that aphids might even or might can spread on next virus. Right? But the tristidia itself won't affect the other crop. It would just only affect your citrus varieties. And it's not all citrus varieties will be affected by the citrus tristesia virus. So there are two more questions before I go over to the persons in the audience. Crystal wants to know, is this caratrax the same one used to spray the chicken poop? Caratrax? No, not caratrax. Oh, she means cabaret. Cabaret, yeah, same, same, same caraberry to dust the chicken poop. However, you have to be aware of the pre harvest So generally, before you put in your birds to generally wait at least wait at least a week to two weeks before, right? And and the application is usually to control the beetles within the chicken house or your or your ants or the cons. Well the same same cover. Okay, and Nola wants to know I have aphids on my gungo last year. Which are already matured and bearing since last year. What can I use to get rid of them apart from spraying as they are, my back, they are in my backyard and I wouldn't have facility for spraying? All right. So uh, one of the better, uh, the best option would be to spray them because the population is kind is, is very high. But 
All right, what you can do is to, you can come up with home remedies. So there are different uh, home remedies that you can come up with to control them. Or if you want to pick, uh, to acquire a softer chemistry like a botanic garden, that would be a good, a good option as well. But you can come up with home remedies to use. Yeah, but in terms of mechanical control, and what I mean is that trying to pick them off individually, that can be very difficult because the population is generally high. Okay, Chantal, you may go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. I just good wanted afternoon. to find out about the, the Miller Sugar Express because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm growing scotch bonnet peppers. Can I use it in my scotch bonnet pepper? Yes, I can use it in a scotch bonnet pepper. But generally, yes, because scotch bonnet is a crop that you're going to pick continuously. Mm -hmm. What I usually recommend is in rotation with Nutrient Express. And what I mean by rotation, so this week, you basically mm -hmm. you can apply a sugar express and then next week you apply a nutrient express. And the reason for that is that the sugar express will develop some of the material the, the mature fruits mm -hmm. while the application of the nutrient express will further develop the younger ones. Right? The younger ones, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you don't want to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't want to spray right. back to back to force right the younger ones. Oh, okay. All right, great. Next question. Is, is there anything I, I, I can do about blossom and rock? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. Well, you know, sweet peppers. All right. So for the fruits that have already been affected, you can basically uh, cure that. So you just have those okay. pick off fruits. But for, mm -hmm. for future for future control, we have mm -hmm. the Calmax bead, Omix Calmax bead. This is very effective in preventing mm -hmm. a blossom in rock. Calmax B? Yeah, Omix Calmax B. Okay. Calmax because B. because right. that's that's a deficiency in calcium, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And with the time getting hotter, you'll see. Um, you have a call from three eight zero one. So Omix Calmax B. So My phone shut down since where I was talking from. Mm -hmm. Wait, let's see the call for us. Actually, uh, they shut down again. So, if anything, you mm -hmm. can. Uh, I cannot talk because I have YouTube and, and TV going on at the same time. All so right. We're here, we're here in Georgia. Hold on, hold on. I hear you, Jackson. Hello. Yes. You there? Yes. So you said the Calmax. Yeah, the Omix Calmax day. And and what I, what I, uh what I usually recommend is that if you can apply it early in the morning, so when you have transpiration occurring like later in the day, you'd have you'd have quick uptake of the calcium. And usually, as well, I usually recommend applying it with the Omix Fortify. And the reason being is that. The phosphate in the fortify can quickly carry around the calcium through the plant. Right? So if you, if you if you're having a day that you're not getting a lot of wind or or heat to kind of create a, a lot of transpiration, the fortify will will help to carry around the calcium much easier in the plant. Yes, Chantal, you may go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, welcome. All right, any more questions, Georgia? So go ahead and ask on the question. Yes, Janai, go ahead. All right, thanks. 
All right, so of the Miller Express line of products, which product has both zinc and calcium together in the formulation? Of the Express line of, of the Miller Ex Express line of products, which product has both the zinc and calcium? You can put your answer in the chat and someone will respond. Janari, Nola Rice huh? says that MC Express. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Give me that name again now. Nola Rice is the first name that came up with the answer. All right. Nola, you're first correct. Name that I see. Yes, you're correct, Nola. ZMC Express is the product. And remember I said, going into the hotter times where you usually have a lot of uh, your symptoms, your virus problem being displayed, I tell you to get a uh, Miller ZMC Express. All right. All right, any more, any more questions relating to virus control or any other problems that you have before we go? And I, Muriel, wanted to find out if all of the products are organic. So um, I'm just letting her know. Muriel, have I? No, not all of the products are organic. Some of them are organic. Yeah. But they're. Um, and some of them uh, are certified organic. Um, yeah. And some of them are softer chemicals. Softer, so, yeah. for example, the Refast is a softer chemical. That, that can be used, but it's not, it doesn't have the organic certification. And for the foliar nutrients, a lot of them are made from food grade, high quality materials. So they are safe though. They, they, they are, are safe. So you won't have any traces of any heavy metals after the application, right? Or any phytotoxicity. From, in, from chlorine or anything like that. They're a safer solution. Some, somebody also in the chat had asked earlier a question about if the products are harmful to bees. Um, what we always, some of it's, um, it's debatable, but there is um, the, some, some scientists have said that the, what you call the new nicotinoid, um, are harmful to bees. But what we always say, when you use any pesticides, you just use them when, in, when, when you're not seeing the bees around, foraging around, especially if you can avoid spraying when you have um, flowering or blooming plants nearby, that would be best. Otherwise, you don't want to spray the pesticides when you know that the bees are out foraging just to avoid them coming in contact with the products. Yes, that's, a, that's an excellent answer. That. And that's why I usually recommend that farmers, if you can, I generally recommend late in the evening. So by that time, you won't have any foraging of the bees. Yeah, uh, good time. And as stated before, uh, growers, what they can do, get familiar with some of the beneficial pests, right? So you can Google some of them to know what, what, no, some of the beneficial insects, sorry. So you can know what, what insects are pests to your production or beneficial to your production. Good day. Yes, sir. Afternoon. Yeah, my pepper, uh, a plant, red pepper, leaf 
curling and also uh, the plummy tomato. And I see the button start right now. You see, you see what? What can I use? You were saying something about the bottom. Repeat. You were saying something about the bottom of the fruit? Yeah, no, the um the leaf, the bottom leaf, the tomato plant. They are yellowing. Okay, okay. All right. So that could be from those natural senescence, right? That could be from natural senescence. Because if you're just seeing a gradual yellowing okay. and no lesions and no spots, that could just be from natural senescence. God, those are the older leaf, mm -hmm. you have them going to naturally die off. But the curling of the paper, it depends, you know. Are you seeing oh. you, you were here for the real presentation where I was showing the different the coloration within the, the, the paper? As it could be, it could be that no, it. because I signed up when I got the okay. All right, because curling, okay, what, could... I, all right, what I do, no, the, 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 huh? go ahead. No, 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 continue, continue. You're, you're chipping in and out, okay? Yeah, I'm saying that. The, what I realized though, it starts fruiting, but fruits, I realized that the curl, at least them that are curled, I realized that the fruits are small. But for the other one that the leaf is not so curled, you see the fruits them bigger. Okay, all right. So it could mean that it could be several things. It could be that the plant could be suffering from a viral problem or it's under stress, under stress. So it could be water stress or it could be a viral problem. So you're seeing any pattern in the leaf in those that are curling? You see any pattern, any dark green to light green coloration? Mm, not necessarily. No. The greenness look even. Up. It looks not well, the green look okay to me. Okay, yeah, okay. Some of them dark green and some light green. In terms of the foliage, yeah. So it could it could be it could be some environmental factors because if you're if you're are and generally uh it could be water distribution. But if, if the water distribution is not even, you'll generally see some plants basically nice and lush, while others look shriveled or, or look underperforming. So water distribution can sometimes tell you if if plants are picking up nutrients evenly. It could be, it could be, it could be some other factor. Go ahead, if it, if it, I was just saying, if it's the younger leaves at the top, it could be also might affecting the leaves and the fruit as well. The fruits would come out small and deformed. Yes, yes, that's true, that's true. So, yeah. So you're talking about severe curling, severe curling? Or, or just well, yeah, some of them, it curls up. It, it curls up, it don't curls down, curls up. Curl like up. almost closing or something. Okay, all right. So what we have to probably do is is to look under the foliage and see if you see any any insect activity. Uh, generally, when you have like sucking insects affecting a plant, you generally have generally would see the plant showing that that curl. So you could you could look under okay. the foliage. Yeah, yeah. But but to confirm, somebody may have to visit. If you're in any other, well, you should be in any other one of the PD areas. So where are you exactly? I'm in St. Mary, Enfield. St. Mary. So then it's like it would be a rep. Or, or Patrick Kenyon. One of them could basically come out that side and check. Oh, yeah, Mr. Lecky. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could, you could ask him to, to visit so he can basically diagnose the problem. As I say, it could be it could be a range All of right. factors. Yeah. All right. The the conversation and already discussion is is really interesting, but I think we have to um, wrap it up because I know that 
we um some people have to leave but you can always go back and look on youtube you can look back at the video um you can always call us 876-757-0022-224 if you have any more questions uh, we'll put you on to the relevant um, product development agronomist and they will be in contact with you all right so you take care thanks again for joining us thanks Jen Noy, for that presentation i hope that those who were present were able to learn something and Give, give you some interesting information about the viruses, how they uh, come about and how they are spread and what you can do to mitigate um, your viral attack on your plants. So have a good evening, everyone. Take care. All right, Be take safe. care. Remember your, remember your your um, COVID protocols, be safe, wear a mask, keep your distance, wash your hands regularly, and keep on farming. All right, take care.